in a dark world filled with deceit. One united voice is crying out. Revealing the truth of God's word. It's time to expose the hidden truth. And unravel the lies. While we're living in Satan's little season. With Sister Crystal and Brother Phil. Welcome to Living in Satan's Little Season show. We're your hosts, Sister Crystal and Brother Phil. Hello everyone. And we got another doozy for you. This time the topic is the second coming of Christ. And we're going to go over the scriptures that really discuss this topic. And why we believe that Christ has already come. There's so much evidence in scripture that Christ stated that he was coming back in that generation. That we want to bring this to your attention so you understand. No, we're not just making all this up or this isn't just something that came out of our brains. No, he, he says it so many times that we can't just ignore his words. It's not an evil prank we're trying to fool everyone. We really want to share the truth. And it's so evident throughout scriptures what that truth is. And we're going to share it with right now. Now, I know this isn't what a lot of people want to hear, because they want to hear, hey, guess what? Christ is going to come back for me. I'm not going to die. My preacher told me it's imminent any time now. When I'm telling you, no, it's not going to be imminent. He already came, and it's not going to be for us. It wasn't meant for us. It never was meant for us, but that's good news, because that means we don't have to go through the Great Tribulation. We don't have to go through all that. All we have to do now is just live in a day and age and avoid deception. Understanding this fact is going to put us way ahead of the mark. Understanding that the world and what Satan is pushing in this world is all designed to trick us into not believing in Jesus. And that's all of what this world is doing, getting us to be fooled. We want to show you the scriptures that talk about the imminent return of Christ. There's so many of them. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to start in Revelation because these aren't obviously telling us exactly, oh, well, Christ is going to return right now. But he gives us a lot of places in Revelation that talks about how soon. He's coming back. He's coming soon. And that letter was written to seven real churches that were around at that time. It was seven cities and their churches. And some of them were going through a a great trial and struggle because they were being persecuted. They were going through the Great Tribulation, as as John had already stated. And so we're going to read the first one here. Revelation 3, verse 11. And Crystal, you want to go ahead and read that one? Okay, so behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have that no one may take your crown. Okay, so, but here he's trying to say he's coming back soon. In other words, you know, here's this church in dire straits. He was just saying, don't renounce me. Follow me. Uh, Listen, I'm coming back soon, and so no one can take your crown. In other words, if this was untrue and he hasn't returned yet, what would be the point of him saying, oh, I'm coming again soon, and then he never comes? And the church is already dead and gone, and everyone in that church is gone. That makes really no sense. In my opinion, this was within years a few years at most. So when this was written, this was very quickly. He was trying to say, listen, I'm, I know you guys are enduring all this hardship and stuff. I need you to just hold on so that you can receive your crown. Because remember, Revelation chapter 20 tells us that those who endure to the end, they were going to reign with Christ for a thousand years. So I mean, they were going to be right. priests of God and reign. But they were going to receive a crown. It all fits in with what Revelation 20 says about those who you know got beheaded for Christ and all that mm-hmm. kind of stuff. And we haven't really gone over that passage yet. And we'll do that in another day. But I just want you to understand, these people were in desperate, dire straits. Right. They needed hope. They needed hope, and Christ gave them the hope that they needed so that they could endure to the end. Exactly what we need to to understand. And we have hope as well, just in a different time frame. We're, We're not going through the tribulation as much as we're going through a deception, staunch, difficult deception that is challenging. And we have to refute the lies and stick to what we know is true, and that's the Word of God. The, the next three um, quickly passages are found at the very last chapter of the Bible. It's kind of a closing remark to all the churches there to just, you know, hey, just hold on. I mean, it's kind of almost like Christ is just repeating himself. Like, just, I'm going to come quickly. Just hold on, guys. And like the last statement they make 
so that you, because a lot of times you remember the last thing you read or you hear. <laughs> right. So he's just trying to say, listen, just hold on. I'm coming again or I'm coming soon. Mm. Just hold on. And so in Revelation chapter 22, which is the very last chapter of the Bible. Right. You have Jesus giving this hope to these mm. churches. And this is what you need to understand. Now let's go ahead and read the first one. Go ahead. Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Yeah, that's Revelation chapter 22, verse 11, verse seven. 7. And so the next one, Revelation 22, 12. Go ahead. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to everyone according to his work. Okay, and this goes into the idea that each person is going to be rewarded, and this is even true at the Great White Throne Judgment, is according to their works. There is a reward that everyone's going to receive, which is called eternal life, but also there's going to be a reward individually, depending on their, your work. So the more work you do for the Lord and everything else, you're going to get rewarded for that. It's kind of like he's going to pay us different depending on how much work we've done, essentially. It's like a good uh, employee employer would do the same thing. You know, he's not going to reward the lazy employees for not doing much just because they show up and get a paycheck. No, God is a righteous judge and will reward each according to their works. It has nothing to do with salvation. It has to do with the reward you're going to get for the work in, th that you do in this life. And of course, that reward will be given to us. And that's why Jesus says, store for yourselves treasures in heaven, in heaven and all that stuff. In other words, the work we do here gets kind of stored up in heaven. And when Christ returns, he's going to give us those rewards. But of course, he's here now. And he's already dished out the rewards to those people he was writing to. So let's go ahead and read the next one. Revelation twenty two twenty, He who testifies to these things, surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Okay, so that's almost like one of the last verses in the Bible. That's mm -hmm. actually the last thing that's really stated in the Bible right. that's designed for us to understand, no, he was coming quickly. And it was written to those seven churches. These aren't the only ones of the reason why, well, you know, yeah, they were quickly passages, but, you know, maybe a day is a thousand years to the Lord. And, <laughs> you know, I've heard this so many times that maybe quickly to the Lord is 2,000 years. Okay, uh, l let's let's look at some other passages. So let's go on to some ones that kind of give us a little more indication of some timeline. Now let's go back to Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, er even them who have pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. Okay, so this is very clear here. He was saying, this is John writing about Jesus Christ's return. He'll be coming in the clouds. That's just exactly the description that we get in, in 1 Thessalonians. He's coming in the clouds with the holy angels and all that all that stuff. So we know this is exactly the same thing he's talking about. What does it say here? Every eye is going to see him when he comes. Right. But then he goes on to give a de definition. Even those who pierced him. So the people that pierced him on the cross, when he was dying on the cross, they poked were, the side. were going to see his return. That's a pretty powerful statement right there. So he's basically, John, saying, giving a timeline. Yeah. It has to be within that guy's, those people's lives. Now, my guess is they were probably young soldiers that were there, maybe in their early 20s or whatever. Mm -hmm. And they were just doing their job like they were supposed to. But it said that they were going to see his, and every eye was going to see his return at that time. So this is an important passage because here it very clearly states, even those who pierced him. That's amazing. Him. Yeah. Okay. I know that one passage, maybe that doesn't, that's not going to convince you. Okay. But there are others. And we're going to go into those now. The most important one is found in Matthew chapter 24. Okay. Right. This is Jesus himself giving a prophecy about the destruction mm -hmm. of the temple in Jerusalem. This actually is a very much parallel passage to Zechariah chapter 14 that we actually discussed in a previous episode. And Jesus is discussing this event that's going to take place with the sacking of Jerusalem and how it's going to get destroyed and all this other stuff. The abomination that causes desolation that even Daniel talked about, which right. is Jerusalem getting destroyed. Jesus talks about this. This passage and Zechariah 14 are parallel passages. If you read them both, you understand, okay, they both give slightly different details, but same event. So I'm going to read this. It's kind of lengthy because I normally don't like to read a bunch of Bible. You know, Bible, sometimes readings are kind of boring when it comes to these podcasts. I get it. I'm not, I'm like you are, you know, just tell me a nice funny story or whatever. <laughs> but sometimes we got to read in order to convince people, no, we're not just making this stuff up. Right. We're trying to get you to understand that now this is kind of what the Bible states. So let's go ahead and read a little bit of a long passage here. It's Matthew chapter 24, verses 29 through 34. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give it its light, 
the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now learn this parable from the fig tree, when its branch had already become tender and put forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. I know it was a little bit long, a little bit boring, but you know, here he's saying, given a description of his return. Very clearly, immediately, and this is why we say that tribulation happened before Christ's return, because it says right. immediately after the tribulation. Okay, <laughs> so, you know, that's why we put the tribulation first on the timeline. Jesus states it very clearly. The tribulation first, and then immediately after the tribulation is when he's going to come. And that's why the book of Revelation is written during the tribulation. And mm -hmm. he said, I'm coming again soon. Right. So you see, it all makes sense. He's coming in quickly. He's coming in soon because it's after the tribulation is when he's going to show up. Well, and that makes sense because they're enduring this really difficult time. I mean, even more difficult than what we're really going through now. So difficult, in fact, that they needed a, a glimmer of hope. And that's what this was. This was Jesus giving a glimmer of hope of what was going to happen. And they needed it because it was a, you know, such a discouraging time. And so that is what is encouraging that he does care about what we go through. Yeah, and this passage also just is a parallel passage to the First Thessalonians chapter 4, which right. talks about, you know, he's coming in the clouds with the holy angels, right. and everybody will see him, and this is the same event. If you look at the end, the last event, he talks about he's coming in the clouds and gather the elect from the four winds of the earth. In other words, gathering the elect, the Christians, the dead in Christ, everyone who came, from all over the earth. Everyone on earth is going to be collected at that time. From that time, right. And they're going to come and they're going to, and of course, other passages, they're going to reign with Christ at, at that time. But here, the last verse is the key one. Right. And that's one everyone kind of dismisses. And that is, surely I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away until all these things happen. So he's talking to that generation that he was speaking to. So they were hearing this message and going, this generation here will not pass away. Now, I've heard a lot of preachers say, oh, that's the generation that all these signs happen to. That's how people have tried to work around the scripture. But that mm -hmm. doesn't make any sense. He's talking to those people there. And they're asking, well, what's a sign of the end of the age? And he just told them, it's this generation pass away. Your generation here is not going to pass away until mm. all these things be fulfilled. So in other words, you're going to see all this stuff. Or at least your generation will. Maybe not you, because maybe you'll be dead. Which is essentially what happened with all the disciples that, <laughs> right. that were asking them this question. Most of them were dead by the time that well, Yeah, they endured a hardship that they didn't survive because that was what was planned for them. But they are going to be rewarded for that suffering. But, you know, those who were going to endure and wait through that time frame would see him coming. So that was hopeful. And, you know, we could talk a little bit more about this particular topic because here he has the angels coming. Everyone's seeing him come. Of course, coming with his reward. Bringing everybody with him, understanding that this is going to be that generation is going to happen. There are others, but you know, there are so many other ones. I we only grabbed it's a few ex other ones. I'm going to go over that now because go to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew 16, 27 through 28. For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Okay, I don't see how much more clear that could possibly be. I don't know how you can work around that scripture. Yeah. The other one, you know, it's possible, but here he just states, Son of Man's going to come in his glory, holy angels, and of course, we know from other passages we talked about the rewards that he was going to dish out to everyone mm -hmm. who was faithful during that time. Again, everyone gets an individual reward, depending on what they've done. It's all consistent. Everything in the Bible is very consistent. Right. With how God's going to work with everyone. I surely say to you, there are some standing here. <laughs> he was talking to those people and he said, there are some standing here that will not taste death. Oh, that's amazing. Until they see the Son of Man coming 
in, in his kingdom. In other words, he was telling them there are some people standing here today that will, are, are going to see this without dying. They would be able to experience that. You know, I think, you know, when you think about all that we're saying here, who wouldn't want to see Christ return? I certainly think that would be an amazing event. But that wasn't meant for us. I think we read this and we go, oh, I want to be there. But if we look at the fact that this has already happened, we can reconcile. That's okay. That's okay that we weren't allowed to be there. We have something else to look forward to. I know this is kind of a disappointment because everybody wants to, oh, I want Jesus to come for me. I get that. <laughs> I, I understand that. This is my big hang up too. We all want Jesus to come for us. I want to be important too. <laughs> we all want We all want to escape death. And, and as far as I can tell, the only people in history are going to escape death. Were those, are, were those people that were part of that first resurrection. Right. They were alive during the time that Christ came back. They were the only one that were going to escape death. Ever since that time and before that time, nope, everyone else died, including Jesus Christ. So <laughs> we're in good company, folks. <laughs> if we die, you know, we're in good company because Christ died as well. But it's disappointing. I get that because here's my big thing. We've been told by our pastors, by our teachers that, oh, Jesus is going to come in the air for us. We just got to remain faithful and right. it's going to come at any moment. What we're suggesting on this show is that, no, he already came for that generation. We weren't part of that generation, so that's okay. We are going to have to face death and be faithful to the end, which is what Jesus teaches all and all the apostles teach throughout the Bible and, and how most of the people had to endure to the end. Right. They, they had to endure till. We're going to have to endure till death, too, because we're not going to, there's no, there's not another event coming up that we're going to escape death. I don't see one. I've read the entire Bible. <laughs> The only event that comes up <laughs> where people are going to be able to escape death is Christ's return. And since that already happened, we have to face the fa sad fact that we are going to all have to face death in this life. But that's okay. Because if we know who we live for and who we're living for right now, death is not, we're not supposed to be afraid of death. Because we know who we believe in. And we know what comes after death. And we know in Revelation chapter 20, and we haven't really talked about the idea of the Great White Throne Judgment, which is the next really big event for us that we were waiting for. But everyone's going to be judged then according to their works as well. you got the first resurrected people here being judged according to their works. In other words, your work for Jesus Christ, your work for the kingdom of God is going to be rewarded. The work you do, and you know, I've put in so many hours of toil and labor for the kingdom of God, but I don't do it for the pay. I, and I do, I do it no. just because I love God. Yes. I really want to get his message out there. That's all I care about. See, that's our motivation. We shouldn't be, what's in it for me? What can I, what can I get out of it like the world is? We want to do it for God. We want to be ambassadors that are honoring. We're subjects to him because of what his son did for us on the cross. And we want to just be sold out for his message and his truth until the day we die. Death is not the end, people. It is going to be the beginning if we believe in him and his word. And we're a part of the second resurrection. That's what's coming up for us. We don't get that resurrection until death. We've mm. got to remain faithful to the end, the Bible says. And part of the reason for Satan's little season. A lot of people go, why would Christ just come down here and abandon us? He hasn't abandoned us. He is wanting us to choose him. He's given us a choice. Live in a world that has Satan here and has Christ here. Satan wants to use marketing and slick marketing tools in order to win you over to his side. Jesus Christ is using the word of God and he's given to everyone. Right. It's like this. There are two sides, two teams. Who are you going to, what team are you going to be on? Are you going to be the team that gets rewarded now? The team that gets all the worldly treasures? Or are you going to submit to God and his word and be on God's team and be rewarded when God and Jesus deem it being the end of uh, of Satan's little season? Satan loves to reward his people immediately. <laughs> okay? Because patience is a virtue that Satan does not want Christians to have. People that have patience... Satan does not want those people. Hmm. He wants to try to give you everything instantly. That's why yes. you guys, I'm telling you, delayed gratification is so important, to, a, a key to have in Satan's little season right now. Because right. what Satan wants to do is he wants us to get away and just, oh, no, you can have that right now. Mm -hmm. You don't have to wait for it. He wants us to get to where everything we want we get now. So we don't have to be patient That's... and learn that idea of long-suffering. It's fruit of spirit. Which is the fruit of the Spirit. He wants to get every Christian off this. But we need to understand, no, this is what the one thing that we need to have in order to gain true eternal life and endure to the end. Unfortunately, a lot of people can't endure much hardships. They haven't been trained. It's important for us to train ourselves to endure hardships for the kingdom of God. Right. Jesus had to go through hardships. And in some of the songs we sing, his son not sparing. He didn't spare his son a hardship. We are going to have to endure hardships as well. But those hardships will be rewarded. 
And I believe that faith that we have through those hardships, that is what we, we receive through the Holy Spirit and through the Word of God, knowing that we can overcome because he who is before us overcame. A lot of people want to think, well, if God loves me, he won't have me go through hardships. Well, you know what? Jesus went through hardships. <laughs> and he was the only begotten son. So that doesn't fit right. These hardships are designed to help uh, help give us perseverance. Maturity, too. Yes. Mm-hmm. It, it, Think of trials and struggles as being a good thing. You're supposed to do these things. You're supposed to go through and endure these things. Fortunately, we live in a day and age where nobody wants to endure anything. The moment any kind of trial comes up, they quit. That's why you have divorces. You have all kinds of other problems in our society because nobody wants to endure any hardships or any struggles or any suffering. They want instant gratification all the time, and Satan loves that. He loves to give that out. Life is hard, and I've gone through my hardships and struggles But I know that when I was going through them, that God was with me. And he didn't want me to give up on him and what he was producing in me through those hardships. And neither does he want anyone else who's listening to give up. Because he wants us to hold fast to him and to his truth. I hope by the time you've read all these, you understand. And then there are other ones that I didn't even add. Because there's just so many of them that Jesus says the same thing. I'm coming again and this generation will hear my voice and yada yada. There's so many of them that I just, we couldn't even put them all in there because it would just be boring. It would be a half hour of just going over all these scriptures. But let's go over the last one, Luke chapter 9, and hopefully it's the same thing. It's, mm-hmm. He says the same exact thing, except another author saying it. <laughs> so how many different times can right. this be said that we can't understand, okay, no, he came back at that time. Let's go ahead and read that one. So Luke 9, 26 through 27. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed. When he comes in his own glory and in his father's and of the holy angels. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the kingdom of God. Okay, again, he talks about the holy angels come in and he's going to, same exact scenario, same explanation of the other ones. His return with the holy angels, he's going to what? But whoever is ashamed of me. There's another detail here. You got to like, isn't just endure to the end and everything. It's. If you're ashamed of me, I'm not, you're not going to be one of mine when I return with the holy angel. And there's some standing here. We're not going to die. Not going to taste death mm. until they see the Son of Man coming. And there's enough places here that have been like, okay, so he already came. What does that mean? Hmm. Well, see, now we're going to go over next time what's going on here. What's what's happening? What's, what's going to happen next? Right. And see, we're trying to get you to understand it's like what you've been taught about what's really happened in our history it now modifies everything. And so now we're going to go into, as now that you get a basis for why we're saying what we're saying, we're not just making this stuff up. We're not just, oh, okay, um, you believe Jesus Christ came. Okay, that's just your opinion. Well, there's enough scripture here that seems to indicate that, no, this, this all transpired. And right. transpired way back then. Right. And, you know, honestly, you know, a lot of these scriptures were what was holding you up. You really couldn't be sold out to any certain theory and it was some of these scriptures coming soon, coming quickly. This generation will not see death. And it was just, you know, really hard to reconcile. I know that we want to think, oh, we want to be included in all of this. But we're still included in the timeline. It just wasn't this timeline. And, and that's okay. I, I know that I'm important to God. And I want everyone here who's listening to know you are important to God. And we are live in this time frame, this generation, for a reason. And be proud of the purpose and the value that God has for you and in you. And be about encouraged that you are an ambassador for Christ. And you can share this truth and be confident knowing he has a plan and a purpose for now, for you living in this time frame. And like I say, during Satan's little season that we're living in now, it's like it's it's an age of deception. And that's why we're going to go over next week. We're going to go over the... Basically, the idea that what does the age of deception really mean? I call it the mm. age of deception, but it just says that the nations are going to get deceived. Is that There's a difference between ignorance and deception. A deceived person is not ignorant. A deceived person is one who knows the truth, chooses but not he to chooses it. not to believe in that truth right. because he's getting somebody else telling him something different. Or he's, what the Bible has said in other times, that he's believing what his itching ears want to hear. And Satan's really good at doing that. He gets, he confuses everybody. He gets all the information. And he did that in the Old Testament. Mm-hmm. You know, with all, it used to be back in those days, it was all the gods. Oh, do you believe in this god? Baal, you know, Asherah. It, there's so many different gods in those. And he confused everybody because nobody knew who the true god was. It's like we don't live in that day and age anymore, but now he, Satan's confused us with all this other stuff. Mm-hmm. Oh, what church to go to now? What denomination should we go to? Uh, yeah, yeah. Again, same exact scenario 
He just, he just confuses everybody, so everybody just kind of gives up. You don't need to give up. There's no mm. reason for it. The age of deception is the age that we are living in right now. Meaning, all Satan is trying to do is trick us. So our best defense against this is going to be easy. Knowing and reading God's word. It's our only chance we got. And endure to the end. Satan has way more experience than we have. Right. He's got thousands of years of experience. He knows mm-hmm. how the human mind works. We're not going to be able to somehow psychologically figure out how to trick the devil. <laughs> Folks, he's got thousands of years of experience. He, that's why he's wise as a serpent. Our only chance is that we have a book that is more wise than the devil is. And that is our Bibles. That's we got to right. keep reading them and understanding them. We're living in Satan's little season, not only because it's biblical, but also it just makes sense. Join or contact us at satanslowseason.org. This is a non-copyright Living in Satan's Little Season production.